Well, um, now we have a special segment, and I personally have been keenly looking forward to it. From the beginning, uh, we recognize that we mentioned it earlier that the states in our country are hugely important uh, stakeholders in, in climate, con the, the whole conversation about climate. By law, they are stewards to land, water, and biodiversity, but also the adaptation measures urgently needed will require a lot of solutions locally. And who better than state level stakeholders to advise us on what's needed? Also, um, the rulers, the rulers in Malaysia have the ability to set the tone at the top in addition to the constitutional roles that they have. So we thought it would be enlightening to hear points of view from um, the younger members of some of these ruling houses and the future leaders, so to speak. It is therefore with great pleasure, I will introduce the next segment for today. Mengadap ke bawah Luli Yang Maha Mulia Pemangku Raja Pahang, Tengku Makota Tengku Hasanal Ibrahim Alam Shah Ibni Al Sultan Abdullah Riyadudin Al Mustafa Bilal Shah dengan penuh kemuliaan dan kebesarannya. Ampun tuanku beribu-ribu ampun. Sembah Patik mohon diampun. Patik mengadap merafak sembah memohon ampun dan mempersilakan ke bawah Duli Yang Maha Mulia Pemangku Raja Pahang untuk menyampaikan titah pandangan berhubung bincangan meja bulat mengenai pelindungan alam sekitar untuk menanangi isu alam sekitar. Ampun tuanku. Moderator untuk sesi yang berikutnya adalah Puan Karima El Khori, United Nations Resident Coordinator for Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei Darussalam. Izinkan patik berlangsung dalam bahasa Inggeris. Tuanku, a warm welcome. It is an honor and a privilege for me to moderate this launch session of the Roundtable series featuring Your Royal Highness as a special guest. There is no doubt today that we are on a path to global warming that exceeds by at least twofold the 1.5 degree limit set in Paris. The world is facing a climate emergency with catastrophic implications for humanity and the planet. Malaysia has set an ambitious agenda to protect its natural resources and address climate change. Pahang is the largest state in peninsular Malaysia, with the largest forest cover, including the critical central forest spine. Pahang is about nature and mega biodiversity, as well as a long coastline. From your perspective, as an acting ruler of the state of Pahang, how does Tuanku view the difficult balance between economic development and broadening opportunities for people and livelihoods and the environmental conservation. Thank you very much, Karima. It gives me great pleasure to be able to support an open platform for engagement, such as these roundtable sessions. For decades, Pahang's economic development was heavily involved in the plantation sector. It started with rubber, but today it is mainly palm oil. Thousands of households are dependent on the sector for a living and it contributes for the revenues to the state. Other than the palm oil industry, the mining and timber industries have also created many job opportunities for locals. However, it is becoming obvious that such economic opportunities with zero regard for environment are unsustainable and will cause irreversible harm to our biodiversity, planet and future generations. In the past, businesses profited from the unfertile extraction of resources from the environment. However, now we know that all of society will bear the cost of environmental loss and destruction if we do not find solutions for a workable, eco-friendly economic system. With rainforest covering over two-thirds of the state of Pahang, it is no longer an option but a necessity for us to achieve this delicate balance between job creation on the one hand and the conservation of natural capital on the other. Wildlife especially threatened charismatic species such as the tigers, which I am personally passionate about, depends on us to speak and act on their behalf. It is our responsibility to protect them. We must not also forget that forest conservation is also crucial for the communities who depend on the forest for a living, such as the orang asli and indigenous communities. Any action we take must take into consideration their voices to not destroy the land and their ancestral cultures. Moreover, the Orang Asli and indigenous 
knowledge that can potentially generate value that can help meet broader societal objectives, such as conservation of the environment, developing sustainable agriculture, and ensuring food security. We must ensure that such knowledge and traditions do not get lost over time. When it comes to striking a balance between economic development and environmental conservation, we need to understand the nuances and context of these complex problems. We need to find a local narrative where our ecosystem is valued. Since my visit to COP26 in Glasgow last year, it has become apparent to me that we cannot use old ways to solve new problems. If we are to aim for a sustainable future, it is clear that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Unfortunately, there is an information asymmetry. Not everyone has access to information on how the environment can be an economic asset in a way that does not necessitate its destruction. This is partly because as a community, we did not understand the value of such information. We did not consider alternatives to conventional economic activity, which is why now it is important for key players to use their resources to gather this information and data and to share that knowledge so that together we can build a greater and more sustainable economy that will not fail us in the future. Thank you, Franco. I had listened with great attention to your insightful remarks when you returned from Glasgow. I'm also aware of your personal interest in both the history and the future of Baham. Could you share with our audience a few takeaways since you have embarked on this journey and some entry points in the specific context of Baham, but also from a Malaysia national perspective? I will call on all stakeholders in the state to step up and act to address this urgent climate crisis. We must all equip ourselves with the necessary knowledge. And we must understand that we are all a part of a whole and we all need to do this together. It is everyone's responsibility to, and we need to act on many levels and many fronts simultaneously. We, the state of Pahang, should consider declaring our own carbon mitigation targets and including zero waste strategies for our waste management practices. This means having an all organic waste composted, whereas in inorganic waste is separated at source and recycled. Key state players should resolve to work even more closely together to build capacity through data and information collection, to better educate themselves in the workings of ESG-friendly uh, economy. From this, we can collectively consider and implement the adaptation measures that are needed. Furthermore, we should identify opportunities in this transition that will create skilled jobs in the state of Paham because we must protect our people's livelihoods. We require hyper-localized solutions to the adverse weather events such as floods and landslides that are becoming more frequent due to the environmental destruction that is a, a consequence of more than 40 years of improper care for our surrounding biodiversity. Decades ago, society was of the mindset that economic development needed to be championed over environmental conservation. The generation of today is paying the high cost of such decisions. Moving forward, we cannot fail the generations to come. I am confident the right yet of all backgrounds are able to help in the realization and implementation of such solutions. This discussion on environmental conservation must not stop here. It must not rely on state players. The success of green initiatives rely on the collective of all people. Lastly, it is my hope that all of us can come to learn and adapt ESG standards in our daily lives. We must understand that environmental conservation and sustainable economic development are not mutually exclusive pursuits. They should instead be regarded as two sides of the same coin. This is the thinking we need to embed in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Tanko. It has been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you for your commitment and for the action. Junjung kasi, Tuanku. Johan, what did you think? Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. 
Yeah, Sunita. Um, yeah, thank you, Tonku. That, that was um, that was most inspiring, really. Uh, Pahang, as you, as was mentioned, was the largest state in Malaysia, and home to a huge portion of the central forest spine flora and fauna. So the points being espoused by Tuan Ku, uh, are very much significant and very welcome. Sunita. So we are now so pleased to invite our next speaker, Mengadap Yang Amat Mulia Tunggu Besar Sri Menanti, Tunggu Ali Ridaudin Ibni Tuan Ku Muris, Ampun Tunggu Sembah Patik Mohon Diampun. Patik menjunjung kasih atas sudi perkenan Yang Amat Mulia Tunggu Besar Sri Menanti untuk menghadiri perbincangan Meja Bulat Siri 2022 ini. Sesungguhnya, sudi perkenan yang amat mulia tunggu menyampaikan titah pandangan berhubung isu perlindungan alam sekitar tentunya akan menarik lebih banyak perhatian dan memperluaskan lagi kesedaran kepada umum. Ampun tuanku, sesi perbincangan ini akan diteruskan sekali lagi oleh Puan Karima El Khori daripada United Nations dan majlis memohon perkenan meneruskannya dalam bahasa Inggeris. Yang amat mulia, Tunku Besar Suri Menanti, Tunku Ali Radaudin Ibni Tuanku Mohrez of Nigeri Sembilan. Thank you for joining us, Tunku. I'm very pleased to see you again. Tunku, given your diverse background, your personal engagement on environment and climate issues, and your knowledge of the challenges facing the world and Malaysia, and also opportunities for commitment and action, it would be great if you could share with us some initial remarks, and then I will ask him with your permission a couple of questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Karima, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, round table. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, and as you say, um, I wear many hats, and, and you know, I think the last time we met, which is actually I think the first time we physically met, uh, was at the uh, Net Zero launch. Uh, which you very kindly attended. Uh, and that was a joint collaboration between WWF and BCG, um, which I attended in my capacity as the chairman of WWF Malaysia. That role has given me uh, quite a bit of insight into environmental protection and climate change. And helps me look at things from different perspectives or other perspectives in addition to my role as Tunku Basar Sriminanti and as a corporate citizen. We've already started to see the impact of climate change across the country, um, and you know, as evident, uh, well, as evidenced by the various and very significant floods uh, that hit in December last year. Uh, in the Greece Milan, I personally saw some of the devastation, and it was very, very bad. I went to some of the villages uh, in Jilabu um, and, and other areas, uh, and the you know, I heard firsthand how some of the Houses and the communities uh, were very quickly affected with floodwaters rising um, uh, very swiftly. Um, and in a matter of uh, hours, everything you know, that, that people had worked for for, for, for decades uh, was essentially lost. I mean, it, it was very sad to see this. Um, and you know, from, from what I'm hearing, this is, uh, this is a situation uh, that has gotten worse over the years, so it, it is something that needs to be managed. Um, you know, we, we're already seeing as such the consequences of the climate crisis, and we need to do more to act today. Latest IPCC results uh, have stressed that we have to reduce our climate, uh, our emissions rather, uh, to achieve our best chance of re ensuring that the uh, temperature does not rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and we need to be uh, in line with this to try and achieve our own net, uh, net zero emissions. I think we, we talked a bit about that um, as uh, at the net zero event where we were together. Um, that said, even with an ambition of achieving net zero by 2050, we do need to start moving now. The good thing is that a net zero economy uh, should we, uh, and, and as we move towards it, can actually be positive for the country. We're looking at a situation where we can actually, based on the BCG WWF study that was conducted, actually create up to 2.8 million new jobs um, if we focus on the right sectors. The proposed sectors that we can do this in include uh, jobs in sustainable forestry, renewable energy, public transportation, bioenergy, 
and um, in areas such as uh, electric vehicle or EV manufacturing. The good thing, uh, in addition, is that for Malaysia, we're, um, we're I guess, very blessed in the sense that uh, half of our country is already covered by forests, uh, acting as a carbon sink to, to capture the emissions generated. And, and so our pathway as a country towards net zero is actually made relatively smoother and cheaper. Uh, based on the studies, um, on the studies analysis, our transition to net zero by 2050 requires an amount of less than US $90 billion in investment spanning 30 years. It sounds like a lot of money, and, and obviously it's not a small amount, but if you look at this on a per annum basis, it's actually just about $2.7 billion, uh, which is less than 1% of Malaysia's GDP. Thank you, and thank you, Telco, for this insightful overview and analysis, and also for the passion and for the engagement. Uh, but, you know, combating uh, the climate crisis and avoiding the worst-case scenario would require unprecedented efforts and investments across all sectors, as you kindly mentioned. In your view, um, how can we, Telco, address the persisting concern about the need to engage fully in environment action, while at the same time, also addressing the development needs of the country and of the states? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I think you're absolutely right uh, that the development and, um, I guess, environmental awareness are taken hand in hand, right? Uh, we're still a developing country and it's, it's important that we continue to be able to develop uh, economically. I mean, it, it makes no sense that uh, livelihoods are not improved just for the sake of purely environmental protection. Uh, so I think what we need to do, and I think um, networks such as CAN are actually fantastic in helping to look at this, uh, because they effectively allow us to look at how we can develop the economy and people's lives and um, livelihoods uh, and grow uh, developmentally whilst being responsible and thinking about um, environmental concerns and, and climate change. I think, you know, if, if we look at uh, one of the things, topics that I mentioned just now, talking about forest cover, uh, and I already mentioned we're, we're in a relatively good position already. If you look at Peninsula Malaysia, we have about 43% of forest cover at the moment. The idea would be to, to raise that to 50% um, in order to, to meet our climate pledges. This is equivalent to around 900,000 hectares which again, is not a small amount of land, but I think uh, if we were to look at this uh, from a holistic perspective, it, it can be achieved. And we should think about how we go about doing this. Right? Uh, one of the things we could look at is to, to think about the benefits that we can get from increasing forest cover, not just uh, in terms of the carbon sink, uh, but in terms of how that actually looks at protecting wildlife and other things as well. Um, and, you know, let, let us also not forget the benefits that we can get from the forest in terms of things uh, such as ecotourism and other opportunities. If you look at my background, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, Ulu Bundol, which is a, a forest reserve uh, in between uh, Sremban and Kuala in the Greece Milan, on the road to Srimananti. Uh, and it's a forest reserve. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful area, uh, which is worth spending a lot of time in. Uh, if you were to look at the, the, the WWF study, uh, for example, uh, it, it, it demonstrates that beyond just looking at, at the carbon sink, increased forest cover, there are other things that we can look at from an industrial perspective uh, that can be considered more friendly, things such as moving into obviously more renewable energy, but also looking at building industrial sectors, uh, which would be beneficial in the longer term, for example, uh, looking at building an electric vehicle hub here in Malaysia. I couldn't agree uh, with you more, uh, especially in terms of the approach. I, I believe that this definitely talks to the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and, 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 and the holistic approach, looking at things from an integrated point of view and how various sectors impact positively each other. Um, so thank you for that insight as well. Perhaps a final question and, and more from you on uh, Media Assembly. Uh, how does climate ambition and action translate for the state's economy, 
for the environment and for the people? How do you see it? Wow, oh, okay, that's a big question. Um, Ludwig's Milan is, uh, is not a huge city. Uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, well, but, but substantial enough. We're talking about over a million over inhabitants. Uh, the thing with Ludwig's Milan, uh, obviously, geographically, it's relatively near uh, to Kuala Lumpur, right? Uh, and that's been a great benefit uh, over the years in terms of economic development uh, and also the fact that it's strategically located uh, on that southern corridor between KL uh, and Singapore. Uh, also means uh, that it's really in the pathway of future development, which is important um, for the state. Uh, that said, um, I think as, as we become increasingly aware uh, of climate change and, and, and have to be more environmentally conscious, we need to think about how we conduct that development in a way that is sensitive. Right? Um, Nogi Milan. Uh, has the benefit of having uh, a large manufacturing hub. Uh, there, are, there are many large multinationals that have actually helped themselves there uh, in the state in recent years. Uh, and, and one of the things I would encourage, for example, is as we look at uh, look at uh, attracting more investment, uh, both domestically and, and, uh, and in terms of FDI, um, we could look at sectors such as uh, EVs uh, as, as a potential opportunity uh, to do something in the state. Uh, the state is also quite reliant on, on tourism. There's a lot of um, things uh, happening across the state. Uh, and as I mentioned, ecotourism is another opportunity uh, that we could look at further developing. Uh, and the state government has been quite active uh, in pushing this as, as part of its own agenda uh, already, which is something I'm highly supportive of. Um, from a, from an agriculture perspective, I mean, clearly, uh, food security is another major concern uh, and, and actually also an important part of, of the sustainability agenda. Uh, Negris Milan is, is no different and, and we are focused on doing more in the agricultural space. I think we just need to be uh, conscious about how we go about doing that and, and try to do that in a way that is um, uh, environmentally sensitive as well. I have many more questions and, and certainly uh, I'm happy to spend more time, but I think uh, we, we need to stop here and, and it's been a, a truly, truly enriching uh, a conversation I've learned from you. I'm more curious now about going and checking out uh, Negro Assemblyland as a state, but also to see in how this ambition could translate in the future as we move more seriously into climate action for the people, for uh, uh, the planet and for the economy. Thank you very much, Tim Kru. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kruma. I think, look, ultimately, we're in a position now where awareness is, is greater than it's ever been before. Uh, what we need to do beyond just being aware is, is to take action, right? Um, it's, it's very important that we, uh, those of us who are in a position to have influence in this, whether we're corporate leaders, whether we're state or government leaders, whether we're working with NGOs, I think that we band together um, think about uh, what the implications of, of, of not taking action are and, and then working uh, together to try and push towards achieving net zero, towards ensuring that the uh, temperature rise is limited uh, to that 1.5 degrees Celsius limit uh, in the coming years. I think it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely critical that we do so, uh, but we need to do so in a sensible uh, way that also allows us to continue to develop uh, economically as a country. Well, thank you. Very, very inspiring indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ampun Tunku, Patik dan seluruh warga Ken dan CGM mengucapkan setinggi penghargaan atas sudi perkenan yang amat mulia Tunku Besar Sri Menanti meluangkan masa menyampaikan titah pandangan. Sesungguhnya keberangkatan yang amat mulia Tunku merupakan besar ertinya kepada Patik dan penonton sekalian. Terima kasih. Well, um, I echo that. Uh, young Ahmad Mulia Tunku Ali's speech was very impactful, especially as he is both, you know, he's three things. Uh, he's a senior royal, obviously, in Mrs. Milan. He's WWF chairman. He's also chairman of a public sector company. Uh, so he kind of spans a lot of worlds. Um, it's interesting uh, that he, he also touched upon the, uh, the action thing, you know, um, get, get on with it. Uh, also, another thing he touched upon is the opportunities. 
uh, that, that kind of climate dividend that is out there. I've seen uh, the UK authorities bemoaning the fact that because of, uh, maybe because of Brexit or whatever, that they're, they're afraid that a lot of uh, climate and sustainability jobs are now, now going to be in Europe and, and, and the UK will miss them, whereas previously they would have got them. So countries are competing, competing for sustainability jobs and uh, parts of countries are competing. I think uh, uh, Tukwali um, alluded to that. You know, the Nugis Milan has got this and uh, uh, come to Nugis Milan kind of thing. And I think we'll see more of that, you know, that, um, uh, that the smart states uh, will, will try to grab those jobs uh, quicker and, um, yeah, and, and not be laggards in it. So why not states competing with each other for this climate dividend? So Absolutely. Thank you both, Tanku and, and Tukwali for, for doing this.